People often ask, can you have a relationship with the narcissist? I think this is one of the questions everyone asks themselves shortly after discovering that a person is indeed showing the predictable patterns of narcissistic abuse. The short answer is, yes, you can, but at a tremendous cost. The better question is, how much are you willing to pay in order to maintain that relationship? That question brings the power of choice back to you. In this episode, I'm going to address three parameters of this topic on trying to maintain relationships with abusers and manipulators. Number one, no contact is ideal. Number two, respond versus react when 100% no contact isn't possible or you're not ready yet. Three, you're not a failure if you can't manage the boundaries. When in doubt, refer back to number one. This is Meredith Miller, and you're listening to the Inner Integration Podcast, where you can learn the mindsets and tools to self-heal after narcissistic abuse. Number one, By now, you've surely heard about no contact and why it's so important to set this boundary after abuse. In case you're just hearing about no contact, check out the playlist I made on no contact. You'll find it on the main page of my YouTube channel when you scroll down. Now, while most people have heard that no contact is ideal, not everyone wants to take that advice. I often hear people say, I can't go no contact when they're actually in situations where they could set that boundary. The only situation where you absolutely can't be 100% no contact is when you have children with the narcissist or other manipulator because the law usually requires you to have at least one open channel of communication in order to manage the sharing and well-being of your children. In that situation, you're always going to have to have some contact with the abuser. So it's important to understand this means the absolute most minimal contact possible. This means you end the personal relationship and instead you have a business relationship where you only discuss the sharing of custody, the children's needs and expenses. Any attempt the abuser makes to talk about anything else, to meet up and chat, to bring up past personal issues, you completely ignore. When your ex is making that really difficult, I would recommend using Our Family Wizard or asking your attorney how you can hire a third party in your area to manage the contact so you don't have to be directly in contact with the abuser. Kim Saeed, that's spelled S-A-E-E-D, has a lot of valuable resources for people in that situation, and she really understands it from personal experience. Now, you know, I don't have kids, so this isn't something I have to deal with, and it's also not a topic that I can speak on in depth because I don't have personal experience raising kids with a narcissist. So for those of you who have kids, whenever you hear me or other experts in the field talking about no contact, remember for you, that's a modified form of no contact, which means the very least amount of contact possible simply to manage the needs and well-being of your children and no personal relationship, period. Now, some people who aren't co-parenting with the narcissist say, But Meredith, you don't understand. I can't just cut off my my mother, my father, my whomever. Oh, I get it. I said those same words to myself just a few years ago. People usually learn the hard way. I did too. I ain't gonna lie. It's much easier to go no contact with a partner of a few months or years than a family member who's been there your whole life, whose relationship with you is so laced with guilt, obligation, and fear that your mind maybe can't even conceive of a reality in which you're not in contact. If you're trying to break free from abusive family members, you will likely need to move through layers of experimenting, lessons, and growth until you finally decide to go no contact. From the first moment I realized my mom is a narcissist, in January 2014, when my cousin came to visit and told me that she had been to therapy and realized her mom is a narcissist, 
to the point when I finally went no contact with my mother in August 2017, those three and a half years were full of trial and error, going in and out of denial, building more and stronger boundaries every time another breach and setback occurred, continually feeling poisoned by her energy, even when our relationship was down to just a few text messages per month toward the end. There were a lot of painful experiences and struggles in between. From my perspective now, I would say I put myself through unnecessary suffering by not cutting her off sooner. However, maybe that's how I needed to learn the lesson once and for all. I even had to get stung by a scorpion to learn about the story of the frog and the scorpion. In case you haven't heard it, the story is about a scorpion who asks a frog to take him across a river because he can't swim and the frog can. The frog says, no way, you're a scorpion and you'll sting me. The scorpion says, no, no, you see, I won't sting you because then we'll both die. So the frog believes the scorpion's promise because it makes rational sense and he agrees to carry him across the river. Of course, the scorpion stings him halfway across because that's the nature of a venomous creature. The moral of the story is don't expect people to be something they're not unless you want to risk your life. When we know we're dealing with an abuser, we have to protect ourselves with no contact. I learned the hard way through many abusive relationships and finally the scorpion sting before I finally accept that my mother's influence in my life was toxic and it was putting my life at risk. Every contact I entertained from her was risking my health, my sanity, my well-being, my peace of mind, my success, and everything else good I worked for in my life. Maintaining even a little bit of personal contact with her kept reinforcing to my nervous system that this is acceptable behavior. So naturally, I kept falling into new abusers, even if for a short while. I had to own the responsibility of actively participating in my own demise by maintaining that minimal relationship with my mother. In doing so, I was training my nervous system to keep recognizing abuse as love and home. Of course, other abusers felt comfortable and familiar. That was what I always knew. Going no contact is a boundary and also a reprogramming of your nervous system to stop confusing abuse as love. The only way to teach your subconscious this important distinction is to cut off relationships with people who abuse you. Have a zero tolerance policy for use, abuse, and manipulation. That creates a new neural pathway as you retrain your brain and subconscious mind to stop choosing the same thing over and over again and to move toward that which is healthy. It doesn't make you strong and tough to keep abusive and manipulative people in your life. It makes you a serial victim. Keeping just one manipulative, abusive person in your life is still training your nervous system to tolerate abuse. Being a martyr has no benefits, and it's toxic to your well-being. There's no award for martyrdom. It doesn't make you a saint or a good person when you keep tolerating an abusive relative just because they're family, or an abusive friend because they don't have anyone else or an abusive partner because they're going through a tough time and they can sure tell a good pity ploy. When you know you're dealing with a manipulator or abuser and you still choose to maintain the relationship, that makes you an enabler. It's a relationship of inevitable harm when someone has no self-responsibility, when someone is using blame shifting instead of accepting responsibility. When someone is stonewalling important conversation in someone else's feelings. When someone makes you feel small so they can feel bigger. When someone sucks the life force energy out of you when even a simple conversation leads to exhaustion. When someone undermines and undervalues your joy and success. When someone transfers their insecurities to you through triangulation. When someone is constantly emotionally provoking you because they want your reaction 
aka narcissistic supply. When you're trying to maintain a relationship of inevitable harm like that, you are doing so at the expense of your self-worth, your health, your sanity, your peace, your success, your sense of self. At a certain point, you've got to get real and ask yourself, how much more of your life will you sacrifice? Now, if you're holding on because you keep thinking that one day you can finally have that breakthrough conversation with the abuser, when your rationale and logical points will finally convince them that something is wrong with their behavior and they'll change, you're fooling yourself. That's the trauma bond leading you to put yourself in harm's way again and again. No contact is ideal so that you stop re-traumatizing yourself. The more abuse you endure, the more complex the PTSD becomes and the longer it takes to recover. I'm speaking from personal experience. I had to learn that the hard way. Through nine or ten abusive relationships over the last two decades of my adulthood, and on top of that, the bosses, co-workers, business partners, friends, and other random abusers that showed up in my life because I still hadn't learned the lesson. That lesson actually originated in my family with the legacy of abuse. I wish this information was available to me then. I could have saved myself a lot of trauma and a lot of years of recovery. That's exactly why I put this information out for you, to help you save yourself from going through that same thing. If you want to go no contact, but something's still blocking you, ask yourself, how much more of your life will you sacrifice for someone who clearly doesn't care about you? Or worse yet, someone who pretends to care about you, but their patterns of behavior reveal just the opposite. Going no contact is empowering because it helps you own the responsibility of your choices in life. When you know that you're dealing with a manipulator or abuser and you choose to keep maintaining that relationship, you're actively participating in your failure, in your illness, your powerlessness, your loss of self, and your suffering. We are willing to do that when we don't love and value ourselves. If you can relate to that, then your job is to work on radical self-care so you can rebuild your self-love, self-worth, self-trust, and self-esteem. If you need help with that, you will love my course, the 12-week SANA series. It will take you on a journey through the next three months of developing important foundational self-care practices and healthy mindsets that set yourself up for success in your recovery after abuse. Number two, Respond versus react when 100% no contact isn't possible or you're not ready yet. If you haven't gotten the courage yet to go no contact, or you're co-parenting with the narcissist, or maybe you're planning on leaving your job because you work with the narcissist, but you need to hang on a little while longer until you line up your next gig, then meanwhile, you need to master the art of responding instead of reacting. Even when you have the option to go no contact, it's really hard to make that decision. So most people start with learning how to manage manipulators and abusers better. That's where respond versus react comes in. Narcissists and other manipulators want your emotional reaction. This can be positive or negative. Either way, this emotional energetic currency called narcissistic supply feeds them and makes them stronger. The strategy of respond instead of react is going to be very important if you're co-parenting with a narcissist. You might think that by reacting and yelling or throwing something, making some other grand gesture of aggression or desperation or even using passive aggression like slamming a door, that this makes you look strong and tough. But actually, just the opposite is true. Abusers know that. They know that when they can push your buttons to react and you make yourself look crazy, unhinged, and abusive, it's a double win for them. This is the trap of reactive abuse. This is when abusers will get you to focus on your reaction to the abuse instead of the abuse itself. They will use your lack of self-control and integrity against you. 
Now, you are not responsible for the abuse that they do. However, you are 100% responsible for your actions, and that includes the way you respond or react to the abuse. Now, you can blame the narcissist all you want for, quote-unquote, making you do that, but now you've lowered yourself to their level, and you're using the same excuse they use when they say, you made me hit you, you made me cheat on you. Responding instead of reacting is about stepping up to another level. It's about taking the high road. It's about owning 100% of responsibility for how you show up. It's about self-control even when you want to lose control. It's about standing 100% in integrity with yourself when someone else invites you to step out of integrity and get yourself in trouble. It's about showing up with your power and not giving your power away to anyone else. The moment you react, you've given your power away. You've lost self-control. You've stepped out of integrity. That path will lead you to have deep regrets. It could even get you in trouble with the law. And it will definitely require a lot of self-forgiveness work after you realize how wrong you were and how much of your power you gave away. Responding instead of reacting is about setting boundaries with yourself that stop you from internalizing what the narcissist does or says and prevent you from carrying out their agenda. You've got to understand they want you to lose control. They want you to look crazy, unhinged, and desperate. And the more people you do that in front of, the better you make the narcissist look and the worse you look to others. If you absolutely have to deal with the narcissist, learn to master your response so you can save yourself a lot of emotional turmoil and energetic exhaustion. It's still going to be emotionally provoking and draining to deal with manipulators and abusers to maintain these boundaries, but you'll lose a lot less if you can master your response. So what is this response exactly? Well, it's much like the gray rock technique. You start acting boring, uninteresting, uninterested, unopinionated, uninvolved in the drama. You stop taking responsibility for their feelings and problems. You stop entertaining their provoking conversations by going on the defensive. You stop giving them an emotional reaction, whether positive or negative, to anything they say or do. You stop sharing personal things about yourself. Maybe you're thinking, oh my God, how am I supposed to do that? You have no idea the lengths they will go to to get me to react. Oh, I know. And that's why this isn't easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. This work is about mastering yourself, and that's hard work. Keep in mind that when you suddenly take away the narcissistic supply they were used to getting from you and your reactions, they will hate this. They'll call you cold, abusive, uncaring, condescending, changed, and other names. That's okay. Act like you don't care. You don't even notice. Their statements don't reflect who you really are. They are simply saying those things to try to provoke your reaction because they used to get that before from you. They will likely escalate their attempts to get a reaction out of you. So you've got to be on your A game. Stay the course and don't give in. Sometimes you can use deflection phrases like, hmm to avoid reacting to whatever they said. Or, that's interesting, when they share an unwanted opinion with you. Could be when they tell you, you're such a bitch, or you're such a dick. Or, that's possible for those similar situations. You can say things like, maybe, when they're trying to get you to do something that you're definitely not going to do, and instead of directly confronting them by saying no, you can say, maybe, we'll think about it. And then when they come to you and say, you know, you're just so cold, you're really changed, you didn't used to be like this, you used to be such a warm person, you can just say something like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Now, if they're unleashing havoc on you, you might say something like, I can see you're very upset and I won't tolerate this treatment, so I'm leaving now, or hanging up, 
And when you're ready to have an adult conversation, we can discuss this. Sometimes dropping the ball entirely with silence, ignoring whatever they're saying, hanging up or walking out of the environment is the best solution, especially when they won't stop or listen to your boundary. Sometimes you may want to redirect the responsibility back to them when they're playing victim about a situation not related to you, but they're trying to get your attention, they're trying to get you involved in the drama, they want your pity, they want you to feel bad for them, so then you'll do something for them. So instead, you can say something like, that sounds frustrating. What do you think you'll do about it? Now, maybe it's someone who always complains about their life. They're just like vomiting up all their drama and toxicity at you in order to extract narcissistic supply in the form of sympathy, which is incredibly draining. So you can say to them, I'm sorry you're suffering. I need to get back to work now. I hope you feel better. And of course, you can change that. I need to get back to work now. It could be... I need to go pick up the kids or one of my kids is calling me or whatever you need to put in there. You'll need to be willing to walk away or hang up if they ignore your boundary and keep whinging, trying to get you to stay there and take it like a garbage bin. Or maybe it's someone in the family who calls you to gossip about family members or share someone's embarrassing medical issues in great detail. So you can interrupt them and say something like, I really don't want to hear about this. If you'd like to talk about something else, that's fine. And if not, I need to go. Keep in mind that your ability to master responding versus reacting doesn't mean the abuser or manipulator will stop doing those things that they do. They'll keep trying tactics to try to find something that presses your buttons. You'll always be having to manage these boundaries, playing some form of energetic and verbal tai chi in order to maintain the relationship, which is utterly exhausting. It's inevitable that one day they'll catch you off guard and you'll slip and react. That's okay. Forgive yourself and strengthen your boundaries right away. Use those experiences to remind yourself how toxic that relationship is to your life and well-being. Let it be a wake-up call that maybe it's time for you to set more definite boundaries like no contact. Even though you're learning not to internalize the things they say and do and not to react to those things externally, you're still going to feel it. In front of them, you're going to master the poker face where you don't let them see the emotional upset in the moment. But as soon as you get to privacy and safety, you'll need to make time to process those emotions. You'll have a lot of emotions to process, so this will entail a lot of work. And if you're still in regular contact, you're going to be constantly having to set aside time and energy to do emotional processing. At some point, hopefully it will dawn on you that all that time you're wasting and all that emotional energy you could be using to enjoy life, to learn something new, to explore someplace new, to love yourself and others, to reach another level of success that you never thought was possible for you. It's important to remember that unless you are forced to have minimal contact by law in the case of co-parenting, this is a choice that you're making by maintaining contact. The boundaries of responding instead of reacting will help a lot. But you'll always be on that gerbil wheel, expending a lot of time and energy and not getting anywhere. This is why responding versus reacting is best for maintaining short-term, temporary situations until you can go no contact. Three, you're not a failure if you can't manage the boundaries. When in doubt, refer to number one. Now, this is a hard realization to come to. What will likely happen if you choose to maintain contact with someone abusive that you could go no contact with, and again, that means anyone who isn't the co-parent of your children who by law you must remain in contact with, what will inevitably happen is a breakdown. This is normal because you're human. Abusers will push you to your edge, and even when you're doing a great job managing the responding versus reacting boundary, Most abusers will eventually cross the line of no return. 
This isn't always a direct action they take or something they say, though it could be, but it might also be more of some kind of life crisis that happens to you that rips you out of your daily grind and forces you to look at the ugly truth that you didn't want to see, like a scorpion sting. You are bound to fall at times trying to manage the boundaries with abusive people because you're dealing with boundary bulldozers. It's their superpower. It's what they do best. They're always cooking up new creative ways to get you. They'll catch you when you're down or when you're feeling weak or even in moments of non-mindfulness when you're distracted with life's other stresses. When you fall, not if, but when, remind yourself you're not a failure if you can't manage the boundaries. When you get to that point, I recommend you refer back to number one, no contact is ideal. I'm going to play for you a four-minute clip of a voice note that I recorded late at night while laying in bed on June 10th, 2017, just two months before I went no contact with my mother and toward the end of my recovery from the scorpion sting. Now, this clip is raw and vulnerable, and I'm sharing it with you because I'm sure that you'll relate. You're not a failure if you can't manage the boundaries with a toxic person. Sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you just get to this point where you realize you are powerless to fight that. And you're done fighting that. You have a different fight. You have a purposeful fight, a meaningful fight, something worth it versus wasting all your energy and your time fighting something that you will always lose. Like you are literally powerless, like in front of that. That's, that's what you realize when you try and try and try to manage the boundaries and it's just not working. And yeah, there's like all kinds of collateral damage. Usually, unless that person had no ties to anyone else in your life. But if you're talking about family members, definitely talking about collateral damage. It's going to send tidal waves out. The point of no return changes everything. And uh, other people might try to convince you that you're a failure or something's wrong with you. You didn't fail. You didn't fail. You won because you took the reins of your destiny back in your hands and you redirected your fight. You redirected your energy towards something that's worth it towards something that's going to bring you joy versus more pain and struggle and exhaustion and confusion and being beaten down. Enough of that. Enough of that. Sometimes we just get to this point where we just got to stop fighting that. Like something. Like is there something in your life that, that you're fighting that is a is losing battle? You know, there's there's the fights that We need to fight, and there's the fights that we waste our precious energy on. And then we don't get ahead in life. Like, we don't get better. We don't move forward because we're wasting all our energy in this, like, bottomless pit, black hole thing that is a losing battle. You can't fight the nature of the black hole. You certainly don't want to get pulled into the event horizon. There's nothing you can do at that point. Just don't waste your fight on anything that's not worth it anymore. Save your energy. You know, ask yourself, like, is this worth it? Before you get all wrapped up in it, like, physically or mentally or emotionally or spiritually, like, is this really worth it? Is this this the fight that I want to fight every day or am I done with this? Because it only works if you participate, you know? But if you opt out, (laughs) there's no more fight over there. The person is just going to fight with themselves or find someone else to fight with. And meanwhile, you can conserve your energy for the good fight. (laughs) The good fight. Is it worth it? Is this the fight I want to invest in? I couldn't quite see it at the time that I was painting my own prison bars. They weren't real. I could walk out at any point. I was living in another country far away from her. Yet I was keeping myself stuck there. I even saw the door open at points, but instead of walking out, I closed the door on myself. I participated in my own imprisonment. 
I continued to reinforce the feeling that I was a failure, something my mother would love for me to feel because then I wouldn't be living my true potential and purpose. If it were up to her, instead of doing this for a living, I would be working a job at the mall. Now, if you told me four years ago that I had the chance to walk out of that prison cell, I wouldn't have believed you because I couldn't possibly imagine that my life would turn around like this since I was still living in the prison. But now, looking back, I can reflect. What if I'd stayed in relationship with her? What if I'd surrendered to the life that she wanted for me and the failure of a person that she believed me to be? What if I never took a stand against the abuse and never invested everything I had into living my purpose? If I had surrendered and gone to the mall to work for minimum wage in some kind of soul-sucking job, how many people wouldn't have been helped? Now, you got to ask yourself that same question. What is the cost of you not taking action to cut off the toxic people in your life? How many people are not going to get help if you don't take action now? If not now, when? What would your future self say to you right here and now listening to this podcast? There's a debate about they make me feel versus I feel. Now, this really comes down to your responsibility. If you're with someone who does things that make you feel insecure, anxious, uptight, and hypervigilant, you are choosing to feel that way by keeping that person in your life. You can't just force yourself not to feel the way you do. So stop hanging out with that person if you don't like how you feel when you hang out with them and afterward. It's your responsibility to remove yourself from that environment if it's not okay for you. It's not your responsibility to try to change them by teaching them how to be a decent human being. If you're sticking around, you need to ask yourself why. If you're still telling yourself, I can't leave, I can't not be in contact with that person, and if this isn't the co-parent of one of your children, then I ask you, really? Or are you just painting your own prison bars? It doesn't have to be today, tomorrow, this week. Maybe you need time. You need a plan to get out. You need to take actions and that might take time. Okay, so set a deadline and take consistent action toward it, which is very different than just staying in a situation and telling yourself that you can't leave. So this debate really comes down to asking yourself, Are you painting your own prison bars? When you can own the responsibility of your choices, you're no longer a victim. That's when you become a survivor. I know my advice can be tough love. I'm sure it's hard to hear sometimes. I also think this is what draws certain people to my content because they know that what I say is not going to be sugar-coated. It's not going to coddle people into remaining victims and feeling sorry for themselves. It's not going to commiserate or help you indulge in narc bashing without owning your own self-responsibility. My advice is served straight, no chaser, so you can get directly to the heart of the issues, so you can take decisive action to transform yourself and your life after abuse. After you go no contact, you still need to unsubscribe from the narcissist reality because their distorted reality, their false beliefs, and all the degrading things they said and did to you remains programmed in your subconscious mind. This will happen even if the abuser is dead and gone from this earthly plane. If you've been no contact with the abusers in your life, but you're still struggling with the self-sabotage due to the old abuse programming, check out my new course, Ending Self-Sabotage After Narcissistic Abuse, so you can learn how to reprogram your mind like a mental ninja. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Inner Integration Podcast. I hope you learned something today that helps you see from a new perspective so you can take new action and transform your life after narcissistic abuse. Remember, you are enough, you matter, and you got this. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, You can subscribe to get automatic updates on new podcast episodes as they're released. 
Visit us online at www.innerintegration.com where you'll get a free three-part video course when you enter your name and email on the homepage. Get loads of more free content to help you heal after narcissistic abuse on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Big hug to you.